And good morning to you. It's good to be in God's house, whether you're here in this physical place or you're joining us virtually. We're glad to welcome you to worship this morning. Paul and I had the fun of driving down Turnigan Arm yesterday. Our son Cameron had a gig in Hope, the little town that's across the inlet. It was called the Hope Hangout. <laughs> and so um, we went down, Cam's uh, wife and uh, one-year-old son joined us as well as our daughter and her two-month-old daughter and her husband. And so we hung out in Hope for three hours or so. It was really fun. You always every year the beauty of Alaska in the fall just surprises me the the drive was amazing yesterday hope was beautiful the sun was sparkling on the water and then we drove back we left about 8 15 maybe 8 30 so it was getting dark but the long twilights that we're blessed with now and then driving home in the dark like I can't remember the last time we drove somewhere in the dark right you know it was just kind of weird but we had a great day it was a beautiful day as it looks like today too so we're glad to welcome you to worship we're glad to be uh, praising God together and now I'll ask Sue Ellen to lead us together please stand good morning <coughs> excuse me when the world around us seems to be shaking, God's love is our foothold, which shall not be moved. When the life within us is dry and parched, God's word is our wellspring, our fount of living water. Let us worship the one who offers us wisdom and teaches us how to serve. Let us pray. Almighty God, you created the heavens and the earth and humankind in your image. Teach us to discern your hand in all your works and to serve you with reverence and thanksgiving. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first hymn is Now Thank We All Our God, number 643. <coughs> now the call to confession. It is only by the power of God that we are able to stand against evil. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Let us pray together. God of wisdom, forgive our foolishness. We desire what we do not need and corrupt our relationships with envy. You urge us to gentleness, but we stir up conflict. Give us your grace 
that we may harvest righteousness and peace. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our teacher, we pray. Amen. Continue now confessing your sins in the silence of your heart. Now stand firm in your faith, covered by the saving grace of God, and ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen, and please be seated. I want to talk to the kids now before you go off to Sunday school. So yesterday, what happened here at the church? Who knows what happened? Some of you were here. What happened? Whitney, uh, Peyton, what happened? We had a garage sale here, we did. Yeah, did you help? Yeah, Olivia, you helped, I saw you here, right? Peter and Penelope were here. Claire and Abigail were here, right? So did, why did we do that, have the garage sale? What do you think? What did we do it for? Who knows? To raise money for the church, yeah. And, um, and I got a total from Jamie. How much did we raise? $1,200. So that's pretty cool considering we were selling what was in our garages, right? That we don't need anymore. So that's pretty cool. But do you think the people that came, like I came for a little while and I saw people here and it seemed like they really needed stuff right? Like I didn't buy anything because I need to ditch my stuff, right? It's better for me to get stuff out of my garage than into it. But it seemed to me that the people that were looking around, they really needed things, right? Do you think so? Do you think it was a good thing that we could do that for them? Because it's getting colder now, right? And if some of us bought stuff for fun, that's okay too, right? I saw a lot of fun stuff out there. So do you think it makes God happy? When we like say that we love him and we do it with our feet too, do you think it makes God happy when we find ways to serve him? I think so. And I'm glad that we're all getting to do it together here because it was fun. There were donuts, right? From Grizzly Donuts, Elizabeth, right? Weren't they from Grizzly Donuts? Yeah, did anybody eat any? Peter, did you have a, yeah, Peter did, okay. So I haven't been to Grizzly Donuts yet, which is like a shame because it's right across the street, but I saw that they were good. So I'm glad you guys helped, thank you. Thank you for everyone who contributed and spent so many hours here getting it ready. It was fun, I think, and a great effort. So let's pray together. Holy God, we thank you for the work that we get to do together and for people who were helped and for our Christian education and mission ministries that can benefit as well as our community. Thank you that no matter how old we are or how many gifts we have, we can use them for you. And so we ask that you bless the work we do together. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Sunday school. Yes, please do. Thanks, Whitney. So those of you virtual who couldn't maybe hear Whitney, she was just thanking the community. The youth group stood outside for four hours. When we came, we could see them waving signs and truck drivers driving by were honking. And so, um, and basically, if you came in the building this morning or if you drive by, there's a few things left in the front. And there were so many rooms filled with stuff. And all that's left now is those few things in the front. So there were big bookcases that went away. And so it was really an awesome effort on so many levels. So thank you, Whitney, for all your work. OK, thank you. Suellen? <coughs> Hear now the word of God from Psalm 1. You will find it on page 383 <coughs> of your pew Bible. Excuse me. <coughs> Sunday morning crud. 
Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The word of God. Amen. Thank you, Sue Ellen. And now as we continue to hear the word of God, let's pray together. Almighty and ever-blessed God, we thank you this day for so many good gifts. The beauty of fall, the wonder of the fellowship we share together, and your word that is written for us in scripture and made flesh for us in Jesus Christ. So as we are hearing your word, we pray that we would be like the one planted by streams of water with our roots deep in the soil of your marvelous love. Help us to draw water from the wells of salvation and to learn from you and one another as we hear your word today. We ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditations and thoughts and prayers of each and every one of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O oh God, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson continues today, our study of the book of Proverbs. Today we're at the very end of Proverbs. It's chapter 31, verses 10 through 31. And now let us hear the word of the Lord. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it's still night and provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it, and out of her earnings she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. And here is the lesson from Proverbs. Isn't that awesome? I just love that passage. Okay. The gospel text today comes from Mark. We're continuing to study Mark. It's today it's chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. They left that place. We're talking about Jesus and the disciples. And they passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant. And they were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. 
He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. And here ends the lesson from the gospel. And finally, we're still studying the book of James, so the letter of James to the ancient church. So today it's chapter three, verse 13 through chapter four, verse eight. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And here in the lesson from James, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this month, in our sermons, we're talking about defining a good life. What does a good life look like? How do we build a good life for ourselves, wherever we are on our life's journey? A good name involves our character and our reputation. Last week, we talked about a good mind and talked about the fact that a good mind means seeking divine knowledge as a way of life learning to show up in the world with a curiosity that opens our lives and connects us to others and to the larger story of the gospel, God's ways with God's people. Today we're talking about a good community because I think when you think about what it means to live a good life, if you were thinking, what does that look like for me in my community, in my town, in my context, who you surround yourself with the people around you, the context you live in, makes a big difference. And the community can determine whether or not this good life that we're seeking happens. So we've looked at Proverbs the last couple of weeks, and we defined Proverbs last week as the book in the Bible that has the little pearls of wisdom, and how scholars think that a couple thousand years ago there were schools of wisdom, and there was a sage, a wise person, who gathered disciples, gathered learners around him, probably him, and taught them in these little sayings that we find in Proverbs. And so now today we're at the very end of the book. Next week we're going to look at a passage from Esther. And we hear again practical advice, counsel for living life. And today we get this wonderful description of a good wife. This passage is often quoted at funerals. Ralph, it, I remember that when we did your mom Lois's funeral here, when we had her funeral, I think the passage that we had, one of the passages that we had was part of this passage from Proverbs. Do you remember that? The one where a good wife of, of noble, you know, who can find and her children arise and call her blessed. And we've done other funerals here for beloved members of the congregation. I'm thinking of Ann Smith and Grace Campbell, those 
of us who remember them. And I think that maybe those texts were part, yes, yeah, Sue Ellen's nodding, so I think some of us remember those texts. So this, this passage, her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. This passage is often quoted at a funeral. And I think we use it at funerals because we're celebrating someone who's gone on to be with Jesus and the fact that it seems like an impossible standard, right, doesn't matter anymore, okay? So when I read this passage, a wife of noble character, and I'm like, oh, okay, you know, I'm here, right, okay. And then, you know, I kind of keep going, and because I had to preach on it, I had to pay more attention than usual, right? And so, and it just seems like this absolutely impossible standard. So somebody that I was reading today, um, here, this is what he said. I'm reading about this passage. He said, um, this woman is indeed a marvel of enterprise and hard-nosed stewardship. She makes the ant in Aesop's fable look like a slacker, okay? If you translated her duties into a modern job description, it would jibe with that of the most successful of CEOs. Today, she would be running a corporation, selling a line of handmade clothing on the home shopping network, and chairing the local United Way. Her husband could brag about her if he wanted, but she would be far beyond the need for that kind of attention. She would truly be a self-made woman. Okay, so that's kind of taking that passage from Proverbs. I'm like, it's okay, you can brag about me, right? Okay, taking that passage from Proverbs and translating it into our understanding, it seems like an impossible standard because it's really a model of a self-made woman. But just the fact that I can say that based on this description from Proverbs means that it was completely contrary to social expectations of the day. Because in the day, in the time and place in which this passage would have been written, a woman belonged to her, her husband, and before that she belonged to her father. She had no legal standing in the eyes of the law. The absolute worst fate for a woman was to be a widow with no children, right? Then she was literally dependent on the goodwill of the community. And the language that's used of this woman, we miss it because we have it translated into English, but it, at the very first um, verse, uh, in verse 10, a wife of noble character, that's really a, dis a way of describing strength and valor in a military context. And contrary to what we see today, back then women were not soldiers, okay? They stayed home and waited. Or when their spouses, brothers, sons, fathers went off to war, many of them conscripted, right? And then in verse 17, where it says, she sets about her work vigorously and her arms are strong for her tasks. Literally, she girds her loins. That's literally. It means she's preparing for battle. So the descriptions used of this woman are not, well, she just stays home and sweeps the floor. They're used of a person who is really doing a man's work in that society, in that context. They're strong confident verbs and descriptions. It's a picture the ancient author is describing of someone who contributes to their household and their community. In, the, in all of old, the Old Testament, the only real person, this is a, not, I don't wanna say caricature because that has a negative con, um, connotation, but this is a picture of a woman and she's not named. The only person who's described this way is Ruth in the book of Ruth. Right, if you know that book and how Ruth was a great, great grandmother, I think, of King David. Maybe the great grandmother, I have to think about it. So the only woman who's described this way besides this woman, this unnamed woman in Proverbs, is Ruth. It's a picture of someone who contributes absolutely to her household, and if you read the task's description to her community, she opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. She makes coverings for her bed. Because of her, her husband is respected at the city gate. In that time, the women stayed home and they did all this stuff. And the men went to the city gate and sat there and there was someone who would come and settle disputes among the townspeople. It's a picture of wisdom for this woman 
but not just for, her, for herself. Her wisdom benefits her family, and beyond that, benefits her community. So now let's turn to Mark, because Mark's gospel shows us again what that doesn't look like, okay? Last week, we saw the disciples, and we saw, we heard Jesus saying to Peter, you know, get behind me. And so Mark tells us in today's text that Jesus was continuing to teach his disciples about his upcoming suffering and death and resurrection. Again, like last week, the disciples don't understand. Jesus' way of discipleship is clearly hard to accept. They're not getting what they thought they were getting, right? So Jesus had to explain. That's a pattern over and over in Mark's gospel. Jesus explains very clearly. He says, don't tell anybody, but the text is very clear. The Son of Man must suffer, turned over to the hands of deceitful men. This one is really clear. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, right? There's a play on words there. And will suffer, and after three days he'll rise. And then they don't understand it, and Jesus has to further the explanation. So that's exactly what happens. It happened last week in last week's text, Mark, and now it happens today too. Over and over, Jesus teaches, the disciples misunderstand, and then Jesus explains further. Because his way of discipleship is not what they thought they were gonna have. This time, gee, they were afraid to ask, right? They didn't understand what he meant, Mark says, and they were afraid to ask him about it. So I've been thinking about that because why would they be afraid to ask Jesus, right? They loved him, they were choosing to follow him. And I think it's because they really did know what he meant and they didn't want to deal with it, right? You know, they were afraid to ask him, afraid to get clarification because then it would become really clear. So that's just what I think is happening. But why does Mark say they were afraid to ask him about it? It has something to do with the next part of the text. They came to Capernaum, which was Jesus' home base when he was in the Galilee, and they went into the house, which I think is the house Jesus stayed in, whoever's house it was, Peter, Peter's mother. And usually in Mark's gospel, when Jesus and his disciples enter a house, then there's more teaching and more clarity. And so he says to them, what were you arguing about on the road? Okay, now, Clearly, he was walking ahead of them or behind them, and he wasn't part of the conversation, but he asks them, what were you arguing about on the road? In John's gospel, there's always kind of two levels of conversation, right? There's a level of conversation, and then Jesus isn't there, but he, and he knows about the conversation. That usually doesn't happen in Mark's gospel. Mark's like, this happened, and this happened, and this happened. But here, the disciples are on the way with Jesus. They're arguing on the road. And they kept quiet when they asked him a question, when he asked them, because on the way, they'd been arguing about who was the greatest. Mark doesn't give us any more information about this conversation, but we know from the other gospels that James and John had been arguing about which one of them was gonna sit on the right. When Jesus came to glory, they sort of conveniently didn't hear the part about be handed over to the hands of sinful men and suffer and be killed, right? They missed that part. And then be rise, raised again, right? They got that part. And James and John have been arguing about, well, which one is going to sit on the right and which one is going to sit on the left? So Mark doesn't give us those details. We just know them from other Gospels. But they were silent because they were ashamed about their conversation. So it's kind of like whoever, who, did anybody ever pass notes in school? Okay right? And did it ever happen to you, this happened to me only one time, that the teacher saw it and said, oh, can I have that note, please, right? Read it to the class. Did, yeah, some of you are nodding. Okay, so that happened, okay? Like somehow Jesus knew what they were talking about, like the kids in the back seat whispering and they think you can't hear them, you know, and all moms have eyes in the back of their head and ears too, right? You know, no? Okay, so they were arguing basically about which one of them was going to get to sit at the head table, Okay, and Jesus knew it. And so, Jesus says, okay, I have to get this clear to you. Jim Edwards, great commentary on Mark's gospel, says that Jesus is counting the costs of discipleship, right? Take up your cross and follow me. The disciples are trying to count its assets, 
ooh, look at this great rabbi. I want to sit next to him. You know, every once in a while. I mean, it's been a long time since we've seen a picture of a state dinner in England, right, in Buckingham Palace because of COVID. But I can remember reading an article once, and there's this, just this huge, long table, and all the gold played, and you know, you name it, right? And there's like 50 forks, right? And four different sizes of spoons and all that stuff. And the queen is there, and who was sitting in closest proximity, proximity to her was like planned out for you know, weeks, if not years, right? Because whoever's closest to the queen is in the position of the highest honor. Right? Look, Google, it's just fascinating if you read about this, the precedence. And I think if there's a state banquet in the White House, same thing happens. It's just there's not like a thousand years of history and precedence to make it more real, okay? So that's what the disciples are arguing about. Which one of us gets to sit closest to him in glory? And Jesus says, okay. He calls the 12, and he just puts it really easily. Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. Okay? Then he offers an object lesson. He stops talking. He sees a little child. Okay? Now in Greek, at least here, the word for servant and the word for little child is the same. Okay? Not always, but here. And when we read this passage, we have this filter of how much we treasure our children. I'm not saying that negatively because, you know, I have this, two, she's two months today, this grandbaby that's living with me for four more days and then they're moving. But, and I have another, uh, you know, and those children, those of us who have children and grandchildren, they are the absolute centered delights of our lives, right? I watch my children with their children, and it's just a gift from God to me. I'm not saying that men and women, mothers and fathers in Jesus' day, didn't love their children. I'm not saying that at all. But children were dispensable. If you had too many kids, you just left one by the side of the road. You exposed the child to the air. Children were dispensable, unimportant. They weren't, they didn't, weren't really even considered people who thought and had emotions and, and opinions, right? They had no power, no standing, not much affection, and disposable. And there was a practice in the Roman world that when a family had a child that they didn't want, a newborn, they would just take the baby outside the town, the village, and leave the baby by the side of the road. And if a Roman of good standing who could afford to keep the child was walking down the road and he saw that child, he could take that child and if he held up the child and showed the community, it meant that he adopted that child and held up the child. And when a new baby was born into a Roman household, the dad would take the child and hold the child up. Does, does anybody know the movie The Lion King? Okay, so when Simba, you know, he is, is it Simba the, um, the dad lion or the kid lion? The kid lion. Okay, so whoever the dad lion is, it's been a long time since I saw that movie. I just have this mental picture of the dad lion holding the, babe, the baby lion up, right? To the community, to the whole desert, to the whole grassland. Okay, that's what the Roman dad did. He took this child and he held it up and he said, this child is mine and I acknowledge him or her. Jesus takes a little child who had no standing, no power, no nothing in the community and he brings the child into the circle. Okay, so remember when a Jewish rabbi taught his disciples, he sat down in a chair or a, you know, lounge or something and the disciples sat at his feet and they were in a circle around him so that he could teach them. Jesus takes this little child, this servant child, right? Because that's the same word. Brings the child into the circle. Placed among them. He placed the child in their midst, the text says. And he says, whoever welcomes one of these little ones in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me also welcomes the one who sent me. This is what God's kingdom looks like, Jesus says. 
This is what service looks like, Jesus says. This is what a community looks like, Jesus says. Welcome a child, welcome God. Jim Edwards again says, the humblest act of kindness sets off a chain reaction that shakes heaven itself. The humblest act of kindness sets off a chain reaction that shakes heaven itself. For whatever is done to the little and the least is done to Jesus. And whatever is done to Jesus is done to God. This is what a community looks like. Service, compassion, and care for the least and the lost. Those of us who came to the church yesterday got an example of that concept in action. That's exactly what happened. It's the wisdom from heaven, as James says. Show your good life. Show by your good life that you fear God. We talked a little bit about that last week, fear as in not hiding under the bed, but as in awe and reverence. This is wisdom from heaven. It's pure and peaceable. It's considerate. It's submissive. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's full of mercy and good fruit. It's impartial and sincere. It's peaceable. It's wisdom that manifests itself in action. Wisdom that builds up the community. James is all about walking the talk. It's welcoming the children and the least and the lost. It's fearing the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Come near to God, James says. And Jesus says that means by coming near to a child. And God will come near to you. That's a good life. That's a good community. Alleluia. Amen. Let's pray. Holy and mighty God, we thank you for wisdom, for people who show us how to walk with you. Help us to learn to welcome each other as we learn to welcome those to whom you send us and who come to us. Help us to learn to build up our community in faith and hope and trust and love for you and all the world. We pray all these things in your strong and mighty name. Amen. And how can we pray for each other? this day and this week. Anyone? Nancy. My niece, my niece is in the hospital today with premature labor. They're trying to pump contractions and, and giving the baby the steroids. Okay. All right. Nancy's niece is in the hospital with premature labor. They're trying to give the baby a little bit more time, huh? Okay, Donna. Okay. My dear in okay, so folks who are battling cancer, Donna's cousin in particular. Okay. Yes, uh, Linda. Okay, so Linda's friend Tammy, right? Okay, who has back surgery this week. Okay, anyone else? Yes, Evelyn. Okay, with mental illness. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, Elizabeth. Okay. Okay, Scott Bailey's friend Don. Was it D O N or D A W N? D O N, okay. All right. Anybody else? Yes, Megan. Cool. Okay, new baby. Third baby. Okay. 
All right. I know there are people traveling. Lloyd and Carol left Friday morning. They were in Toke Friday. We don't know where they got. Our daughter and son-in-law are leaving Thursday morning to move to Colorado Springs, so they're going to have a fun drive down the highway. Anybody else? We saw a prayer request from the Presbytery a couple days ago. So Roy Nagiak has been a faithful commission pastor on the North Slope for many years. He uh, was serving um, some of the time in Wainwright in the, um, in the church, uh, the Ogonic Church. Uh, he had been medevac to Anchorage a couple of weeks ago, I believe, with COVID, and he died um, over the weekend. So if we can remember. Roy Nagiak's family, his wife, and many family members were able to be there with him when he died, but that's a, a big loss for his community and for the North Slope. Anybody else? Okay, let's go to God in prayer. Holy and almighty God, we thank you for the blessing that it is to be gathered together here. We thank you for the beauty of the world, for the trees flaming like fire on the mountains and the tundra turning so many different colors and the crisp mornings and the sunny afternoons. We thank you that you created the world to shout your praise and you created each of us to join in together. So we thank you for the gift that it is to live here and to acknowledge the beauty that surrounds us and that it all comes from you. We thank you for the gift that it is to come before you with all that we have and all that we are, with our joys and our concerns, our laughter and our tears. We pray for so many people who are struggling today, for people facing treatment for cancer, for people facing surgery, people recovering from it, for people struggling with mental illness and their families, for people in mourning, for the Nagiak family, for so many others who are walking in the darkness of the shadow of death, who have lost parents, spouses, children, grandchildren, dear friends. We pray for strength and comfort and courage for those who are mourning. We pray for strength and comfort and courage for those who are just tired and weary we pray for healthcare workers in our city, in our state, and all over the world who have given so much and have to keep going and working. We pray for strength and time off and encouragement for them. We pray for kids in school and for those who teach them and work with them. We pray for leaders of every kind in every place for people who have been tr entrusted with positions of power and responsibility, that they would seek your face as they lead us. We pray for people in our own community who are hungry and homeless. And we thank you that you entrust us with resources with which to help them and lift them up. We thank you that you entrust us with a community, with this community, for the gift that it is to be part of it. We pray for those who are traveling this week. They would be safe on their journey and welcomed at their journey's end. We thank you for the joys of life, for our new babies and kids growing and changing and surprising us with their knowledge and their laughter. We thank you for strong marriage relationships and for the gift that we are to each other. We thank you for this place and this people and the joy that it is to serve you here together. We thank you, Lord God, and we praise you. We ask that you hear us now, as together we pray the prayer that Christ our Savior taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we have a few announcements. Next Sunday, immediately following this service, we have our fall congregational meeting. 
So the purpose of the meeting is to vote on my terms of call and whatever other business we have. We will have the meeting in person here, but I'll also send a Zoom link at the, um, when I send out the bulletin, when I send out the links for worship. So those of you watching virtually, if you wanna come down and join us at 11, or we will make it possible to join by Zoom. Um, our bylaws require us to make the agenda available uh, a week ahead of time, so there are some copies of the agenda if you'd like to see it a week ahead of time. Um, what's next? We have a couple families who will be uniting with the congregation this month, so if you'd like to join us, um, please talk to me about it. What else? Here's all the ways you can keep up with your financial stewardship. We couldn't do what we do without you and your many gifts. So we thank you and praise you for that. If you have a gift that you brought, you can leave it in the, um, bas in the tray at the back of the church, but let's take a moment to pray. Holy God, we thank you for the good gifts that you give us so that we can return your gifts to you. I thank you for faithful givers and stewards of your resources who give sacrificially so that we can do the work of your kingdom in this place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now our closing hymn is Blessed Assurance. It's number 839. It's also up there. Please stand and let us sing together. And now, good friends, hear this good news. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. Christ, who indwells you, has something he wants to do through you where you are. Believe this and go in God's grace and love and power. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ever ask or imagine, according to God's power that is at work within us, to God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and forever, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen. Bye, everybody. Have a good week. <laughs>